Okay, so we're in chapter 10 of Hebrews, chapter 10 of Hebrews. I hope, did everybody get your notes? Okay. Tonight we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 10. I thought we would make it to 39, but I think all we're going to do is make it to 25. But, but that's okay. We're, we're not on a, a time schedule, are we? Somebody, uh, Sam asked me today, when, when do you think you'll get through with Hebrews? I said, when I get through. That's all I can say. I'm having fun. Whether you're having fun or not, I'm having a lot of fun teaching Hebrews. Hey, during the Vietnam War, some of the POWs were kept in the infamous Hanoi Hilton uh, prisoner of war camp. The enemy tried to destroy them through torture and isolation. But these men knew that they needed each other. And they developed an, an ingenious scheme for communicating with each other. Uh, Ron Bliss, an Air Force pilot, said that they, would, they developed a, a code through, by tapping on the walls of the prisons, prisons, cells. And Ron Bliss said that the Hanoi Hilton sounded like a den of runaway woodpeckers. <laughs> and the North Vietnamese never mastered the code. Listen to this. The code flowed so fluently that the men could share jokes. Every Sunday, every Sunday, a coded signal was sent through the walls and the men stood and recited the Lord's Prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. They knew isolation would destroy them. Now, isolation is dangerous for believers. You take a believer and, and you pull them out from the church and they begin to do the Lone Ranger Christianity stuff, it never works out well, ever. It does not work out well. And yet that seems to be what a lot of Christians are opting for. Jesus Christ, when he said, I, I will build my kingdom and, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Uh, he, he built his church on the idea of the church coming together, of the church needing each other, of the church uh, pooling their resources and helping each other and, and advancing the kingdom of God. And we see that throughout the New Testament. In John chapter 17, verse 11, in Jesus' high priestly prayer, Jesus said, I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me. Now listen to this that they may be one even as we are, unity in the body. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47 says that after Pentecost, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together. Now, note, note that statement. All those who had believed were what? Together. And had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So the New Testament is very clear about the importance of the body of Christ, the family of God coming together and serving him and serving each other. Now imagine what it was like to be a Christian in the first century. 
you know, we, we've studied Hebrews for many, many weeks, and, and we know that the recipients of this letter were Jews, some of whom had committed themselves to Jesus, and some of whom were considering the merits of returning to Judaism. They would have been familiar with the priestly service and the sacrificial system that was prevalent under the Old Covenant or the Mosaic Covenant. When they were born again under the New Covenant, they learned that through Jesus, true forgiveness, reconciliation with God, and eternal security could be theirs. The culture hated believers because of their biblical stand on moral issues. Those involved in the religion of Judaism renounced them because of their commitment to Christ. Pressure and persecution mounted against them. Now look, to be very honest with you, that's not something that probably caught them by surprise. Because if you study the gospel accounts, the four gospel accounts... The Bible's very clear. When Jesus taught the disciples, he said, the world hated me and the world will hate you. Jesus said, if the world persecuted me, the world will persecute you. So a, a true believer should never go with the idea that they're going to get a bunch of pats on the back from the world. You're not, that's not going to happen. So there's going to be pressure there's going to be uh, a persecution, whether advanced persecution or, or being ostracized, whatever it is. But that is going to be a part of every believer's life. It's going to be a part of your life. And I tell you this, with the soon coming of Jesus, he said, he said that times are going to get worse and worse and worse. The idea that we're going to build a better world and everything's going to be uh, hunky-dory. I don't know if you know what that means, but I know what it means. Uh, I know some folks back there who knows what it means. Dr. Horn knows what it means. He's from the country. So it's not, it's not going to be all peaches and cream. It's going to get harder and harder and harder. And you'll have to pay a price for your faith in Jesus Christ and for your stand on the Word of God and biblical principles. Now, their challenge was to keep making progress in their spiritual lives. That's what this letter is all about. Keep making progress in your spiritual life. Don't regress, pro progress, okay? Okay. The, the word therefore at the beginning of verse 19, we went through verse 18 the last time we met. We pick it up with verse 19 and no, notice what the Bible says here. Therefore, now remember what the word therefore is there for. It's there to tell you to look back to what has just been said and to look forward to what's coming. It's a connecting word. So the word therefore at the beginning of verse 19 marks a new section and leads us into several implications that are grounded in the truths the author has just finished discussing in the earlier text. Now, the first thing I'd like to point out to you is the believer's identity in Christ. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 21. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God. Now, understand this. Hebrews shows that Christians, that's you, if you're a born-again believer, you have access to God, which the Jews under the old covenant did not have. Remember, only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies, and that only once a year on the Day of Atonement. And there were very uh, severe restrictions about what he could do and what he couldn't do. Do you know, they even tied a little rope on his ankle when he went in in case he died in the Holy of Holies so they could pull him out. That's a fact. So, 
Hebrews shows that Christians have access to God precisely because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Without Christ's blood, there is no access to God. Let me say that again. Without Christ's shed blood on the cross of Calvary, there is no access to God. Not in this life and not in the, in the next life. So there is no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. Just as the old covenant required blood sacrifices, so does the new covenant. Now, the final and effective blood sacrifice, however, came not through the blood of an animal shed on an altar, but through the blood of God's own son shed on the cross. In his perfect and sinless blood, we have access to enter the, the sanctuary of God in heaven. Okay? Now, one author spoke about the importance of the Christian's identity. By the way, I would tell you that a Christian that does not understand their identity in Christ is like a leaf floating down a river going wherever the current takes it. That's exactly the truth. You've got to know who you are in Christ. That's why the study of the Word of God is so very important. I tell you, I'm having an absolute wonderful time this year. I, I told you that because I'm preaching through the gospel of John, in my quiet time, every morning, I get up, and every week, I read the gospel of John. So at the end of the year, I will have read the gospel of John 52 times. I, I tell you, I'm seeing things I've never seen before. You would think, well, don't you get bored? Reading the same thing week after week? No, absolutely not. Sometimes I go into staff meetings and I share with the staff new things that God shows me that I've read multiple times. It's amazing. So it, it, it's so important that we understand our identity in Christ. And I can't think of a better way for you to understand your identity in Christ than studying the Bible. Reading the Bible, studying the Bible, meditating on the Bible. Now, this Elise Fitzpatrick said, just in case you're unaware, identity theft occurs when someone steals your name and other personal information for fraudulent use. By the way, has anybody in here ever had your information stolen? Okay, we've got a few, okay. And that, that is a bad feeling, isn't it? I mean, that's a horrible feeling. The, the surprising reality, however, is that Christians are, by definition, people who have someone else's identity. You have someone else's identity. Do you know whose identity you have? The Lord Jesus Christ. You've got his identity. They're called Christians because they've taken the identity of Christ. Not only have you been given an identity that you weren't born with or that you didn't earn the right to use, but you're invited to empty the checking account and use all the benefit this identity brings. Hey, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, You have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's part of your identity. And what the Holy Spirit is saying, he said, look, you, you, you write those checks on, on all that Jesus has made available to you. Take advantage of it. Don't leave anything unused. Take advantage of it. Live out your identity in Christ. Now, every believer, let me make this statement. Every believer can have absolute confidence to enter the presence of Almighty God because of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross to save us from our sins. Notice the Bible says in verse 19, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, do you realize that when a Jew would read that, they would read that as the holy of holies? which the high priest could only go in once a year. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place 
by the blood of Jesus. Now, remember the high priest, when he went into the Holy of Holies, he couldn't go in there without blood, sacrificial blood. And he would go in and he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, remember? Now, that blood and could not remove the sins of the people. It couldn't forgive the sins of the people. It could only cover the sins of the people for a period of time. And now under the new covenant, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from what? All sin, the Bible says. Do you realize that every sin of your life, the past sins, the present sins, even the sins that you, are, you will commit in the future, every sin that you've ever committed is under the blood of Jesus. And God has forgiven you at, because you put your faith in Christ. He's forgiven you and separated that sin from you as far as the east is from the west. I tell you, it doesn't get much better than that. Isn't it wonderful to know that when you step into glory, that God's not going to drag you before uh, a throne and make you answer for all the sins of your life? Aren't you glad he's never going to bring them up? Isn't that wonderful? My goodness. How anybody would not want to be a, a follower of Jesus Christ, I just can't understand. So every believer has the confidence to enter the presence of Almighty God because of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. Notice it says this in, in verse 19, excuse me, verse 20. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us, for us through the veil, that is his flesh. Now, what does it mean when it says Jesus inaugurated for us to, uh, an opportunity to come into the presence of Almighty Holy God through a new and living way? Well, think about this. Jesus is alive. He's alive. And where is he right now? Where's Jesus right now? He's seated at the right hand of God the Father where he makes intercession for us. So we can enter the presence of Almighty Holy God through a new and living way that Jesus has made available to us. Now on the basis of these assurances that we have boldness to enter because we have a living high priest, we have an open invitation to enter the presence of God. The old covenant high priest visited the Holy of Holies once a year. But we, listen, we are invited to dwell in the presence of God every moment of each day. What a tremendous privilege that is. Take your Bible, flip back to Hebrews chapter 4 just a moment. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Therefore, there's that word therefore. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Aren't you glad of that? But one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, just zero in on verse 16 again. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Aren't you glad that God's throne is the throne of grace? Where we can receive unmerited favor. The Bible says in, in John chapter 1, that Jesus provides us grace upon grace, grace stacked upon grace, grace to meet every need in your life. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You ever have times of need in your life? Listen, I have been inundated in the last few days by people who have deep, deep needs. And it breaks my heart. I, I told one of the staff members today, I said, man, I cannot wait to get to heaven where there's no sickness, 
There's no sorrow. There's no sin. There's no broken hearts. There's no funerals. There, there's no uh, funeral homes. There, there's no graveyards. Man, I can't wait to get to heaven. You know, when John was trying to describe heaven in Revelation, he couldn't come up with words. So he, all he could do is tell us what's not there. A, a lot of things not there. We do know this, that in the presence of God, there's fullness of joy. And in his right hand, there are pleasures forever. Psalm 1611. Heaven's going to be so wonderful. We spent several weeks studying about heaven earlier. And, and man, that, that was a wonderful study. It just made me homesick. Did it make you homesick? Now, look, I want you to take your Bible. Look, just turn to the right just a little bit. The book of James, chapter 4, verse 7. I want to show you something. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God. You see this verse 8? Draw near to God, and he will what? He'll draw near to you. Do you realize what an invitation that the book of Hebrews and the Bible itself has given to us an engraved invitation to live and dwell in the presence of God. Isn't that wonderful? James 4, 4 8, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. You, you say, but pastor, what, what about those days when I don't do so well? Let, let, me, let me just calm your fears just a moment. Do you realize that on your worst day, God loves you just as much as he loves you on your best day? The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Romans chapter 8 is a wonderful chapter. It begins with no condemnation, and the very last verse, it ends with no separation. Wow. Isn't that good? That's how much God cares about you. And he invites you and invites me as born-again believers to come into his presence on a regular basis and to dwell in his presence. And he says to us, if you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. Man. Now, words like the body of Christ, the house of God, the bride of Christ demonstrate how important the local church is to the Lord Jesus Christ and his scheme for uh, getting the gospel to the world. Now, I want you to look at the believer's intimacy with Christ. The believer's intimacy with Christ. Look at verse 22. Let us draw near, excuse me, verse 21. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. And you see that? Draw near. Now, what did James 4, 8 say? If we draw near to God, he'll draw near to us, right? Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I was talking to a gentleman yesterday, and God's really dealing with his heart. And he, he said, Pastor, what does it mean here in, he, in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 4 when it talks about grieving the Holy Spirit? How do I grieve the Holy Spirit? And I said, well, you've got to understand that as a born-again believer, the Holy Spirit has made your body his temple. It's his temple. The third person of the Trinity, who is just as much God as God the Son and God the Father, the Holy Spirit dwells in your body, and the Holy Spirit has told you to glorify God in your body. Now, any time that you and I sin against God, I told this gentleman that, when we sin against God, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I don't mean that we lose our salvation. I mean this, when we, 
When we act in a way that's contrary to what God has said in his word, it grieves the spirit of God. And what's the spirit of God's goal in our lives as believers? Romans 8, 29 says his goal is to conform us to the image of Jesus. So there's a lot of filing away that has to go on in our lives as God begins that sanctification process at the moment you're justified and he sanctifies you until he glorifies you in his presence in heaven one day. So that, that's a powerful concept. Now look at, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Hey, let me ask you a question. When, when you do something to offend your spouse, do you sometimes get a cold shoulder? I know, here, here's Darlene. No, she's not here, so I can say this. I'll do something. Sometimes I don't know what I do. And, 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 I, and I get the cold shoulder, and I look at her, and you know, you just, after, we've been married 49 years, August 2nd here, and after 49 years, you sort of know when you get in the cold shoulder. And I say, Darlene, what's wrong? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Come on, Darlene, what's wrong? Nothing. Sometimes it's an hour later. Sometimes it's a day later. But she'll find, I'll break her down and she'll tell me what I did. And I'll say, darling, I'm so sorry. Would you please forgive me? I learned a long time ago, don't try to justify my actions, okay? So I just get right with Darlene, we move on. Been doing that for 49 years. Now, now look at this. If we're going to draw near to God, we're going to draw near to God. By the way, that's between us, okay? <laughs> if we're going to draw near to God, we must have a sincere heart. A sincere heart. Uh, that means we're not interested in being part of a church for show. Our hearts are devoted to Jesus. Can I ask you a question tonight? Is your heart devoted to Jesus? Do you long every day to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Christ? Do you long to plead? I love what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 9. He said, My ambition is to please Jesus. Is that your ambition? That's what it means to have a sincere heart. And then we must have full assurance of faith. The believer's faith must rest on the person and work of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven six 6, that without faith it's impossible to please God. Impossible. So we must have full assurance of faith, and we must have our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You know, the cleansing process for a believer, the Bible talks about the washing of, of water with the Word, how the Word of God cleanses it, convicts us of sin. The Holy Spirit uses the Word to convict us of sin and to bring us to a place of godly sorrow and genuine repentance and deep cleansing in our hearts. That's the way God cleanses us. You see, if we're really going to live in the presence of God, then purity and holiness is an absolute necessity for us. We can't play fast and loose with the world and expect to live in the presence of God. Now, I want you to understand that this kind of spiritual growth and development does not happen in isolation from other believers. L listen, we need each other. As born-again believers, we need each other. Now, we've learned about our identity in Christ, our intimacy through Christ, with Christ, and it all happens in the local church. Look at verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now, I want you to notice what 
the, the Holy Spirit did not inspire the author of Hebrews to include here. He didn't say, let us hold fast the confession of our salvation. Didn't do that. We don't have to hold fast our salvation. Jesus does that for us. Take your Bible, look at Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. I love this. Therefore, he is able also to save, how long? Therefore, he is able also to save for how long? Forever. Those who draw near, there's that drawing near, see? Those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. You don't have to keep yourself saved. Jesus keeps you saved. You couldn't keep yourself saved if you tried as hard as you could. Only Jesus can keep you saved. It's called the eternal security of the believer. I'm so glad that my ongoing salvation does not depend upon my works. It depends upon the grace of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Now look at this. Let us hold fast the confession of our what? Our hope. Do you know what the word hope means in the Greek language? We think of hope. We think, man, I, I hope it rains tomorrow. Or I hope I get a new car next year. Or I hope John comes home for Christmas or or whatever. We hope. We wish. It's a wish. But that's not what the biblical word hope means. It means a confident expectation. A confident expectation. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Our confident expectation without wavering. For he who promised. I love this. He who promised is faithful. So we need to remain committed to Jesus. So hold fast the confession of our hope. This pictures uh, some difficulty that threatens the believer. You know, spiritual tenacity demands perseverance without wavering. There must be a progression in our new life in Christ not regression into our old life that we had before Christ. Now, I want you to notice on the next page, we're to remain confident in Christ, for he who promised is faithful. Aren't you glad of that? Aren't you glad that Jesus is faithful? Aren't you glad that regardless of the situation that you're walking through at this very moment, Aren't you glad that through the difficulties and struggles of life that you can know that you know that you know that God loves you, that Jesus loves you, and nothing can ever change that? Aren't you glad that you can know that the grace of God is sufficient for every need in your life? My goodness, he's faithful. So they were confident in his faithfulness. Now listen, the church has a lot of responsibilities in the world. According to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, we are the pillar and support of the truth. Let me tell you, the truth is not going to come through CNN. It's not even going to come through Fox. The truth, I'm talking about biblical, absolute truth, is supported and... and uh, and told to the world through the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our responsibility. And the church is the engine that powers the worldwide spread of the gospel. And the church is the hub of worship and discipleship. So the church is, has such an important work to do. Now to get the job done, now get this, we need each other. We need each other. Have you ever been to California? Have you ever seen those redwood trees? Those things are absolutely huge. I've never seen one. I've seen pictures of them. One day, maybe I'll get to see them. But they're huge. And you would think, looking at a redwood tree, that the roots must go down to China 
you know, to, to have the security and stability that that big redwood needs when the storms come. But you would be wrong. Do you realize redwood trees have very shallow roots? You, you say, oh, Pastor, how do they survive the storms? How do they, say they survive the wind? Well, I'll tell you how they do it. They have very shallow roots, but redwoods are always in a grove. Multiple redwood trees. Do you know what they do? Those little shallow roots of those redwood trees go under the ground and they connect with all the other redwood trees. And they support each other. The whole grove supports every redwood tree in the grove. And that's a beautiful picture of what the church should be and do. Now we need to ask ourselves, how does our involvement in a local church lead to spiritual support? Look at verse 24. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. To love and good deeds. The three great Christian virtues, what are they? Faith, hope, and love, right? You realize that they're right here in these verses. We just talked about hope. We've talked about faith here. And now we're talking about love. Faith, hope, and love. They're the fruit of our fellowship with God in his heavenly sanctuary. So believers, how do they, how, what do we do? We stimulate one another. Now, that phrase, let us consider how to stimulate one another, means to carefully plan to strategize ways that we can motivate each other to be what Jesus wants us to be and do what Jesus wants us to do. Will you agree with me? Life, life, life could be tough. Hurts, disappointments, pain, stress. Furthermore, we have growing antagonism because of our faith in Jesus, our belief in his word. And the Bible says here we need to stimulate one another to love, to love. Jesus said this in John 13, 34 and 35. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. The world will know that we are disciples of Jesus because we love each other. I tell you what, a fussing, fighting church is a contradiction to the Bible. It is. I praise God that our church is a loving church. We love each other. We support each other. Now, now every church has some, some wayward brothers and sisters sometimes. And you know what we do? We love them. We nurture them. We help them to be everything they can be. But by and large, a church should be known for its love. Love for Jesus and love for each other. In 1 John 4, 11, John wrote, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. When God called me to preach when I was 30. I've been coaching football for eight years. Went to New Orleans Seminary. We got down, moved down there in May and, and in August. In August, I got my first church to pastor. It was New Hope Baptist Church. You know how, how big it was? 18 people. It was, a, it was in the country across from a sawmill. And I tell you what, there were about three or four main families in that church and it was like the Hatfield and McCoys. I, I'm not kidding you. And you know what I did? I, I was a pastor of that church for 20 months. Well, the whole time I was a seminary. And I preached through 1 John. And 1 John speaks a lot about love. I know they probably got tired of me preaching on the importance of love. But it was important for that church to understand that principle. Now, I wish I could tell you that everything uh, 
worked real well in that church. It, it didn't. I, re, I remember I got paid $125 a week. God is my witness. We made it on $125 a week. Now, we had folks that were, were a part of our, uh, our church at home, and, and they'd send us $50 here and there. But we basically made it on $125 a week. We ate a lot of red beans and rice. And I remember I'd been a, the pastor for a year. And they had very informal business meetings. They had one a year. And I remember we had the, the business meeting to determine next year's budget. And, and a dear old lady stood up. And she said, I believe we ought to give our pastor a raise. And one other dear lady stood up and she said, oh, they don't need a raise. If they need something, we'll take care of them. That's the truth. It was a, it's a great church to learn to preach in, I can tell you that. <laughs> so we need to stimulate one another to love. And we need to stimulate one another to good deeds. You know, we need to think about ways that we can minister to each other. This church is so good about when there's a, 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 a death in a family or, or, or when somebody's coming home from the hospital and we flood those homes and those families with food. Man, I, I, I tell you, that is such a blessing. And it speaks of love. It speaks of caring for each other. Or, or maybe it's visiting somebody who's going through a tough time. I tell you, if, if you just keep your eyes open and keep your ears open, God will bring people across your path who's going through difficult times, and you'll have a chance to minister to them. So believers stimulate one another to love and good deeds, and believers strengthen one another. Look at verse 25. We'll close with this one. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, I want you to look at that little phrase, encouraging one another. In the Greek, when a commander wanted to exhort his troops who were about to go into a battle, he would encourage them. This word was used, and it literally means to strengthen the arms, to strengthen the arms. That's what we got to be for each other. You see, the church is not a place to tear each other apart with harsh judgment. We need to strengthen one another with our words and with our actions. One thing is for sure, you can't stimulate one another or strengthen one another if you're not here. And that's why he said, do not forsake the assembling of yourself together. Oh man, don't, don't you love to come to church? Don't you love to sing and worship God on Sunday? Don't you love to come into your connect group? and fellowship with each other, and study the Word of God together, and pray for each other, and, and care for each other, and minister to each other. It's a joy. It's a sheer joy. Now listen, faithful attendance in church is not um, optional, not according to this. It's mandatory. It's, ab it's an absolute necessity if we're going to see the Lordship of Jesus championed in our family and in the Carnival community, we have got to be in church. We've got to strengthen each other and support each other. Now, obviously, we should, be, we should desire to be a part of church out of simple obedience because that's what God says. But there's another motivation. I want you to look at the last part. Of verse 25, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about the coming of Christ. Jesus is coming. Listen, I promise you this. He's 2,000 years closer to coming than he was when he came the first time. I remember when I got saved at Mississippi State, guys invited me to a, a film at Dorman Hall, 
And I walked into that film. It was a Billy Graham film. They didn't tell me that, but it was a Billy Graham film. And it was entitled The Road to Armageddon about the second coming of Christ. And I'm telling you, the Spirit of God crushed me with conviction. I went back to my dorm room. I got on my knees. And I confessed my sin to the Lord. And I asked him to forgive me and save me and change my life. I have never been. That's 50 years ago. I've never been the same. I love the Lord. I want to serve him to the day I drop dead. So he's coming. And that's our motivation. Do you realize he could come tomorrow? He could come tonight. And we ought to always anticipate the coming of Christ. It ought to motivate us to do exactly what we've studied in this passage tonight. Now, you know, for, for years, scientists were baffled by the ability of fire ants to form life rafts that help them survive the flash floods of Brazil in the rainforest. As a unified raft, they can even travel for months before reaching dry land. An article in the Los Angeles Times summarized a new research study that has unlocked the secret of this natural mystery. After collecting a bunch of ants, scientists dropped them into containers of water. And they watched those ants quickly form themselves into rafts. You say, how do they do it? Well, each individual ant used its claws and the adhesive pads on their legs to grip each other. Then the insects use air pockets that form around their bodies to keep themselves afloat. Is that not amazing? Our God is an amazing creator God that he would give fire ants. Have you ever, you ever stepped into a bed of fire ants? Man, I just assumed they all drowned. <laughs> but our creator God created them for a purpose. And he gave them the ability to survive the Brazilian floods in the rainforest. I tell you, those ants needed each other, right, to survive? I can tell you this, we need each other to survive too. We need each other. I hope and pray that we will take this text that we've studied tonight and we'll live it out in the days, weeks, and months to come as we await the return of our Lord. Amen? All right. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the Word of God. We're so grateful, Lord, that the Word of God speaks to the realities of our lives. We're so grateful, Lord Jesus, that when you said you would build the church and the gates of Hades would not prevail against it, that you had a plan and purpose for the church. And we are so grateful that you have saved our souls and you've added us to your body and we're now part of the family of God. And I pray, Lord, that until the day we die, that we would look for opportunities to encourage each other, to strengthen each other. I pray that we would love to come to church. We would love to worship. We'd love to study the Bible, to sit under the ministry of God's word, to grow spiritually and be more like you every day. Lord, we love you. We bless you. Fill each person in this room with the spirit of God and help us to serve you this week and to glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you and God bless you.